Okay. Push that. Right there, right projector this sources. One. Yes, and then let it warm up. Is this going to be on also? Uh, we can turn it off if you want. Popular class. Yeah, it's going to be... Uh, that's, that's the way it is in the beginning. Okay, projector's coming on. And you know about the lighting choices? We'll figure it out. Okay, uh, so now you want to do lectern, laptop. There you go. Check up there, there you go. Yeah, that part works. Now let's if see. If you want privacy, you can blank it, but we'll leave it up for now. Lighting controls. And I'd suggest for this time of day, you go with number eight. This one? This one, yes. That kills the front, but leaves the, the main lights on so they don't fall asleep. Okay. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, and one more quick thing. This is my phone number. You call this from here, I can be here in 30 seconds or your next pizza is free. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so the secret is that there is a phone there oh, okay. and you, you, you have to call him from there. Oh, okay. So he just came because he's a good guy. But uh, uh, so, so it turns out that that's the only one that works. The other one is broken. Oh. So, <laughs> so you guys will have to sit on the stairs, like people there. Uh, No, this is uh, people that are not registered. I'll, I'll ask the question, but that's my guess, yeah. So I can see from here that there are a few empty seats. There is one here. So someone grab it. Uh, and there's a couple, third row from the end. So I suggest the third row of the end just stand up and move to the middle to cover this. Please. Yeah, you guys. Stand. Move to the side. Uh, are there any other empty seats? Thanks. Okay, so uh, welcome. This is Applied Machine Learning. Uh, just that these guys will sit. We have here almost all our TAs in the class. Uh, you'll see them later on on the website and hopefully in person a lot. So I think you should find a seat somewhere. Thank you. Um, and this is busy. There are a few places on the on this side. Uh, okay, so, so I'm, I'm Dan Watt. Can you hear me well at the back? Okay. In case you don't, do something at some point, so I'll, I'll figure out what's happening. Similarly, because I see this and it's hard to see the screen, please uh, give me feedback if something goes wrong there. Uh, so as I said, my name is Dan Watt. We're going to uh, study together uh, this semester a class that we called, uh, changed the name to Applied Machine Learning. Uh, this is kind of, uh, there are some seats on the stairs. If, uh, the basic things that you want to know at the beginning, we are meeting here Tuesday, Thursday uh, at 1.30. My office hours uh, are going to be Tuesday, Thursday at 4.30. Um, we have TAs. Most of them are here. Um, just the gist. I'm going to get into this in a little bit more details as we go. This class is going to be a lecture. There are going to be five assignments. All of them are going to be, or most of them, are going to be programming uh, in Python. We're going to have some weekly online quizzes just to help you uh, bring the material to the top of your head before classes. We'll try to have also some weekly discussions in addition to classes run by the TAs, midterm, 
final, maybe a project to, to some of you. Um, the key material for the class is going to be the lecture notes. There's really no good textbook. I'm going to give some pointers. Uh, there's a lot of material online, but the main thing that we're going to rely on are, are lecture notes. Um, okay, a couple of uh, things. One is registration. How many people here are not registered to the class? Okay, quite a few. Not all the people on the waiting list showed up, I see. Uh, we have a long waiting list. Uh, unfortunately, the way PEN works, you can drop classes and add classes just in the first couple of weeks. We'll see what happens. Uh, one request I have, if you think that you're going to drop the class, please, please do it quickly so that other people can get in. Uh, don't wait until the last day because that's going to put more pressure on them and then there are going to be some wasted seat in the class. Um, uh, I get ma daily uh, a dozen email about the waiting list. There's very little I can do given that the class is full. Uh, so only once people uh, get off the list, we can add uh, people. Um, that's one. The other thing, go to the website. It's not completely up to date. It will be completely up to date uh, in terms of details of the class and in terms of tentative schedule uh, over the weekend. You'll see there also uh, a pointer to Piazza, all the communication. Uh, among you, between you and me, between you and the TAs, is going to be through Piazza, so please uh, use it. Okay, so, so what do I want to do today? I want to talk a little bit about what is learning. Um, I want to ask you who you are uh, and tell you what is the class about. If we have time, in fact, I'm going to start doing it now, we're going to play a little bit, uh, a small game. Most of it we're going to do next time. I'm just giving it to you today so that you'll, I know that you like to multitask, so instead of Instagram and, and Facebook and this, you'll, you'll do the puzzle. So, so just send this up. There are not enough for all of you, so please, every two, share one of these. Uh, now, uh, listen to me also. Don't just try to solve this. If you have the solution, don't tell it to anyone. Don't tell me. Don't tell your other friends. We're going to talk about the solution next time. So I'm sure some of you will solve it in the next few minutes. Don't tell us what the solution is. If you want another challenge, think about a good argument for why your solution is correct. Uh, OK, so, so who are you? So I, I really want to know how many are undergrads uh, in CIS? Okay, undergrads in CIS in general, undergrads outside CIS, where? Give me some, what, what departments, what colleges? Uh, math and philosophy. Someone else that raised their hand? Yeah. Uh, Earth Other? Linguistics. Linguistics. Okay, graduate students in CIS, graduate students in CIS outside CIS, okay, graduate students outside CIS, where? Uh, MBA, um, PhD students, there was some. Uh, work in MBA. Others? Okay, so, so quite diverse, probably more diverse than this small sample showed, but it's good, I expected this. Uh, so with this probably comes also diversity in terms of what you've seen in terms of mathematical background, in terms of programming. We're going to try to uh, deal with it one way or another. So here is a poem. You can look at it, read it a little bit, spend a few seconds. Um, and think about it.
can think about also why I show this uh, in a machine learning class. So I see some of you smiling already. So why are you smiling? What's, what's funny, nice about this? Someone? Yes, you want to say something. So you think the spelling is wrong? Okay. If you try to run this on your conventional spell checker, put it in Google Doc or something like this, what will happen? It will pass. They don't know how to discover these context-sensitive spelling mistakes even though all of you by now realize that almost everything here is wrong, most of it sounds right. Uh, so why do I show it here? Except for the fact that it's uh, nice and cool. What's the relevance? Any ideas? Let's assume I would ask you to write a program that takes this as input and corrects the spelling mistakes. Not now, I'm busy. Uh, can you do it? Yeah. You'd have to know something more about the grammatical structure or the uh, the semantic content of the words to be able to correct the mistakes. What do you mean by the semantic content? The, in, the intended, uh, the intended meaning. Okay. Uh, I need to know more than just the word, uh, each string that appears there, yes? And when you say have used these words in the past, what do you mean have used? You really talk about con contextual. Uh, so, so you want to know for each token that is being used here, what is the typical context in which people use it, and whether this is the context it's being used here or not, and whether that means that it's misused here. Yes? You also have to know how this sounds. This is excellent because the way it's written here uh, doesn't reveal all the information <coughs> that uh, you need in order or doesn't necessarily reveal all the information that you need in order to support your decisions. Sometimes maybe you need some phonetic information. So the reason I put it here is because you cannot write a conventional program to correct these mistakes. The only hope that we have, and actually we can do quite well, much better than uh, your Google Doc technology today shows, uh, but you cannot do it with a conventional program. You need machine learning driven technology that reads a lot of text, learns models, uh, contextual models, maybe puts together multiple contextual models to have a chance to uh, to correct this. Now, we're not there yet. We're going to talk a lot, a lot about problems that we can solve. This one is actually harder than you think. But machine learning in general is everywhere today. As you can see, this is why this is popular. Uh, so you've heard a lot about image processing. So you can see a picture like this. And our image processing technology or computer vision technology can do a lot of things about it. It can recognize faces, it can recognize who these people are, it can recognize that they are having fun, it can recognize gender. A lot of predicates can be recognized today with respect to images using machine learning technologies. Uh, your email goes through routinely 
uh, through spam filtering. And it's a machine learning program that determines whether this email, in this case, uh, it says this mail is likely to be spam. Again, a machine learning based predicate. It's hard to do to write a conventional program that will uh, not be very brittle uh, because this is a moving target. Uh, you can do translation today. Uh, the quality varies, uh, but much better than 10 years ago. Uh, in some languages, it's okay. Uh, some English plus some languages, it's okay. Machine learning technology. You buy stuff. You get recommendations. These are all machine learning driven technologies that are based on what other people have bought. And in some cases, also the features of the products uh, that you're buying. So all these are machine learning technologies. So if you want to look, if we want to look specifically at one of them, say spam detection that I highlighted before, what is really going on here? So uh, we have a binary model, binary classifier. Uh, and the idea is to assign to a given email one of two labels. Yes, spam, no, not spam. Uh, and you want to be able to do it uh, for every input uh, that you get. So this is kind of the generic task that we are going to talk about. Uh, classification, this task requires that we learn a model, and this model is going to assign labels, yes, no, plus, minus, positive, negative, to uh, the items. Uh, in this class, what we're going to do is we're going to study algorithms and techniques, not only algorithms, to learn such models from data. Now, if you think about it, this example is, is a pretty typical example to uh, kind of the generic task of machine learning. Uh, you can think about inputs that are documents under some definition of a document. This document is, has a label red. Here is another document that has the label blue. Another one has the label green. Another one, another blue one, another a yellow one, another green one, and so on. So this is the data that you observe in your training session. Documents along with a label, a color in this case. And then you're going to be given a new document of the same type. And the question is going to be, okay, so what's the label of this one? That's the generic task that we have. And maybe your classifier is going to say this one is red too. Now, the definition of document could be many things. It could be documents, and then the labels could be maybe the topic of the document. Is it about sports, politics, finance? It could be single sentences. Uh, and my, uh, I care about the sentiment of the sentence, or the sentiments of the sentence relative to a specific entity. Do we like it or hate it? Is it positive or negative? It could be some phrases that appear in a sentence, and I want to know whether this phrase, Washington, in the context of this sentence is a location or a person or maybe an organization, a sports team. It could be an image, and I want to know is there a cat in the image, a dog in the image, and so on. Or it could be a medical record, and I want to know is this patient going to be admitted again soon or not? So it's a really abstract definition. We call it classification. There's a bunch of inputs with labels. And a lot of machine learning, a lot of the technology that we're going to address this semester actually solves this problem. Uh, now, this is not the only problem we want to solve. Uh, we actually want to solve harder problems. Here is an example, one of my favorite examples in this domain. It's a short story. It's a short story that is given in story comprehension tests to second graders, in fact. So it should be very easy. You can read the story. At the end of the story, you're typically given a few questions. I rephrase the questions to be statements rather than questions. So you can ask yourself, is this statement true in the context of this story? Now, you understand this very easily. Second graders, once they can read, they can understand it. But if you think about it, there's a lot of classification questions hidden inside, inside this understanding. For example, there's people here. You can see Christopher Robin, Mr. Robin, Chris. The classif one classification question here is, 
Is this the same person? Yes or no? What do you think? Is this the same person? Who says yes? Who says no? Okay, read it a few more seconds. Who says yes? Who says no? Too many abstain. So let's say again. Who says yes? Who says no? Okay, by majority it's no. Why is it no? Mr. Robin is the father of, of Chris, right. And uh, while it's not written here, you know from home that if A is the father of B, A and B are two different people, right? So the answer is no, not the same person. So this is one decision that you typically make when you read a story. It's a classification problem. Now, there are many, many other classification problems hidden in this story. There are many pronouns. You want to know who is this he there? Who does the him refer to? Uh, what, is, what is this his? Uh, and so on. Again, you can think about it as a binary classif classification problem. Is the he referring to Chris or to Mr. Robin or to someone else in the story? There are many relations that are expressed here. If you want to understand sentences at the level of who does what to whom, you need to know Someone wrote a poem. Someone has written two books. There are many dates written here, right? And you want to know that there are dates. And you want to know which comes first. Each one of these can be viewed as a classification problem. And you want to be able to learn models. And again, these tasks are very, very difficult to write <coughs> conventionally. You have to be able to have seen a lot of data understand the context under some definition of understand and learn models that can do this. At the end, you want to put all this together to a decision that allows you to answer the question. And I like to think about this more as an inference problem, but um, you can think about all the components as learning problems and you can also think about when was the learning done. The learning was not done once I gave you this story or once I gave the second graders the story. They've learned earlier in other contexts, in different situations, from different data, and eventually brought their models to bear on this. So these are all examples of things that we'll be able to abstract away and learn and develop techniques to deal with. There are other problems that we want to be able to deal with. So I hope you can see this. This is a little bit dark. Uh, what do you see here? Yeah. Car, animals, yes. Things, okay. Yes. Onion, shoes, bell peppers. So the interesting thing is that we got three answers. They're all different and they're all correct. And they differ in levels of granularity. So you talked about onions and bell peppers. Uh, someone could have, talk, could have mentioned vegetables or go all the way up to things. Uh, the interesting thing here is that it doesn't bother you, or one interesting thing, it doesn't bother you that these are completely not uh, up to scale. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the pixel level, some of the shoes look a lot more like cars than they look like other shoes and so on. Uh, so this, I'm giving this as an example of one of the tasks that we're going to look at, which is clustering. So we're going to look at images or other things uh, and try to cluster them. And you can already see that it's a little bit ill-defined uh, because you can talk about vegetables and cars or you can talk about things and you can talk about brown things or green things. Uh, but either way, we want to be able to develop techniques that allows us to say that under some definition of similarity, these things are similar. Okay, so, so these are some examples. So um, I put all these under learning. And, and 
hopefully the examples that I've given that are quite diverse show that learning is really at the core of understanding high level con co cognition. It allows us to uh, perform what I call knowledge intensive inferences, understanding images and what happens there, understanding stories and what happens there. Of course, the key reason I think most of you are here is because it's at the core of building adaptive and intelligent systems. Uh, and in general, dealing with the messy real world data. So this is the key thing that has changed over the last two decades. If before we were writing computer programs that mostly deal with structured, well understood data, databases, uh, Today, we, we write more and more programs that deal with real-world messy data, and we need to be able to uh, develop new sets of techniques in order to do it. So, so learning, the way we discuss it here, has multiple purposes. One of them is knowledge acquisition. We want to learn things. Uh, we want to be able to integrate multiple knowledge sources. You already saw this in the first example of the poem that you need multiple knowledge sources in order to have a chance to even think about it. We want to be able to adapt. Systems want to adapt. As new data comes in, humans also adapt. And we want to be able to support decisions or make predictions. Uh, so, so what is learning? I'm not going to take the risk now and ask you for your own definition, unless someone wants to quickly propose something. Okay, so we're going to go with Herbert Simon, who is a Nobel laureate in, in economics, and he gave a definition years ago uh, of what he thinks learning is. And the way he said it is uh, learning denotes changes in the system that are adaptive in the sense that they enable the system to do the task or tasks drawn from the same population more efficiently and more effectively the next time. Okay, makes sense. So, wh what are the key phrases here in this definition from your perspective? Yeah? Yeah, excellent. So, this is also what I thought is the key thing because this is, uh, this shows what is the key challenge that machine learning really faces. Uh, and even though this class is not going to focus a lot on theory, we will talk a little bit about why learning works and what could be our expectations for machine learning system. And this is going to be at the heart of this. Uh, we make an assumption that what we've seen is what we're going to see. Now, this is never the case for humans, at least not at a very fine level. So the question for us is going to be, what does it mean to be from the same population? How do we define this? Uh, if it's exactly the same as you've seen before, uninteresting. You want to be able to make things a little bit more general. So my definition of learning, which builds on this, is, is really the ability to perform a task in a situation which has never been encountered before. So, so to me, and this is the message that I want to be able to uh, send this, in this class, is really learning is generalization. You are never going to see the same thing again. When you try to understand what I'm saying behind my fine accent, you've never heard this before. Nevertheless, you pretty much manage to understand what I'm saying. When you look left and right and you see things, you've never seen these images before at a fine level of granularity. Never. First time, last time. Nevertheless, you manage to abstract it enough so that you can make decisions, make predictions, live through this. So the core of learning, therefore, is generalization. Uh, and, and in fact, the question that we're going to ask is, what should we do in order to support generalization? Uh, so if we are going to the task that I discussed before, spam filtering, for example, the idea, as we said, is that uh, the model 
mail in this case, thinks that this message is junk mail. Um, and the learner has to be able to classify items it has never seen before. That's the key thing. So we have to be able to learn a model in such a way that it generalizes to instances it has never seen before. And this is the case everywhere. You know, every machine learning driven task that you think about could be direct classification, medical diagnosis, credit card applications, identifying handwritten letters. It could be planning and acting, game playing, uh, driving a car. It could be a robot performing various skills, or it could be common sense reasoning type task like natural language understanding. In all these cases, uh, the ability to perform a task in a situation which has never been encountered before is the real challenge that we have. And, and one of the things that uh, I'm going to try to emphasize is something that people don't think about it at all, and, and for some reason the the press that talks a lot about machine learning doesn't talk enough about, the secret to machine learning is really not so much the algorithm. Even though we're going to spend all the time in the class or the majority of the time on various algorithms, the secret really is in the representation. Generalization depends on the representation. How do we represent the input? What inputs does the learning algorithm see governs its ability to generalize more than the specific algorithm you're going to use. So um, by representation, I mean here, what does the algorithm really get as input? When I showed you the story, when I showed you the poem, when I showed you the images, you saw something. I actually don't know exactly what you've seen. And probably each one of you has seen something different. Uh, because you abstracted away the input. You generated a new representation. This is the representation that we want to give, or something like this is the representation we want to give to the learning algorithm. If you think about this, if this picture, this image, is what your learning algorithm saw, and then I'm going to give it this image, just a darker image, gray level, the input is not the same input. Right? Think about it at the pixel level, it's not the same input. You want an algorithm that only saw these kind of images, but is capable of dealing with this. So you need to be able to develop a representation that perhaps abstracts over some of the details so that it's capable of saying something about things that it has never seen before. Similarly, or maybe even more complicated, here is a question answering task. In New York State, the longest period of daylight, daylight occurs during the month of June. You know, you have a model. I don't know how it works. It probably puts some pieces of information together. But your model should be able to replace New York State, say, by New Zealand? The answer is different. December. But it's the same procedure in principle, right? You know something about Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere. You know where these places are. It's the same procedure. The question is, can you write a program? Can you learn a model? that abstracts the information beyond N-E-Y, N-E-W-Y-O-R-K, and so on, and actually captures the fact that what's important here is Northern Hemisphere versus Southern Hemisphere. This is an abstraction level that is in the representation. If you can do this, you can learn better models, you can make decisions that has better generalization. So that's, that's something really to carry with you as we are talking about uh, things in class, as you are solving problems, as you are moving on to, to actually do machine learning. Okay, so, so why do we uh, do machine learning? Well, one reason is because a lot of important people that I quote here say that that's the right thing to do. Uh, so that's why you came to the class. Uh, Bill Gates said so and a few other people. There's one alarming thing here that 
almost all the companies uh, that are listed on this slide are either gone or on their way to be gone, but forget that. There are really good reasons to study machine learning. And, and I think the key reason from your perspective, or at least the majority of you, is we want to develop computer systems with new capabilities. Um, so many of you, I think, also care more about understanding human biological learning. Maybe a few of you think that it could even understand teaching better, allow us to understand teaching better. Uh, either way, whatever your goal is, at the basic level, you want to be able to do the same thing. Uh, so the reason machine learning is so popular today, and it's, it's really the right time. We have initial algorithms and theory in place. This is something that uh, you couldn't say when I did my PhD uh, 20 some years ago. Um, uh, we do have a pretty good understanding of learning theory in many domains. We have good algorithms. We have growing amounts of online data. Whether this is sufficient or not is an issue that we want to be able to. Sufficient in the sense whether we care about data or we care about other things beyond data is something that we'll have to discuss this semester. We have computational power, and it turns out that this is crucially important. Uh, so everything is in place, but also necessity. As I said, many things we want to do today cannot be done by conventional programming. All the examples I've given before cannot be done by conventional programming because they deal with real-world messy data, they deal with context dependencies, and you want to be able to develop uh, better methods. Um, okay, so, and, and of course, you know, learning is the future. So I think that learning is going to be the basis uh, for almost every application that involves the connection to the real world. Um, uh, so not only will be able, will need to learn how to develop better representation and better algorithms, we'll also need to develop uh, better programming languages that learning is at their core rather than uh, what we are doing today. There's a lot of very, very interesting uh, opportunities, uh, both at the application level and at the core uh, machine learning level. Of course, there are many unresolved issues. Um, some of you may care about it, most of you may not both at the theory and the system level. Um, many things we don't know, uh, but our job in this class is going to be to try to tell you what, mostly what we do know and um, maybe leave a few kind of thoughts on what's open, on what's important that is open uh, to think about. Okay, so, so uh, I want to move back and start talking more and more about the class itself rather than motivate machine learning. I know that you're all motivated anyhow. So work in machine learning, I think about it as a key component of AI in general, although it has a lot of theoretical work. It's really an experimental field, so it borrows from all these areas. It makes use of probability and statistics Linear algebra, theory of computation, these are kind of the underlying uh, <coughs> fields that one has to know in order to play with machine learning. And hopefully, you all have some background in this. I'm going to get to it uh, more later. It's related to many, many things. Philosophy, psychology, linguistics, uh, many other areas. And of course, it has applications everywhere not only in AI, most of the examples I've given are from natural language, from vision, planning, robotics, human-computer interaction, all these uh, are core, but outside AI, general engineering, uh, general computer science, architecture, compilers, systems, all these uh, make use of machine learning techniques today, and of course the real world, you know, from internet companies to finance companies, legal, retail, you name it all of them begin to use machine learning techniques one way or another, and all of them want to use more machine learning techniques. So that is very good, 
for people that do machine learning. Um, it's a very, very active field. It also is, uh, it brings some problems to people like me that also teach machine learning because the question is what to teach. There's an exponential growth in the number of papers that people are writing about machine learning. Most of it will not stay. That's the way things are. And, and we have to make a decision on what's important, on what we think is important, what has to be taught in order to give you the foundations to do machine learning in a world that is going to be very, very different than today's machine learning. You're going to do machine learning in five years, ten years, maybe more. It's going to be different. So, so I'm going to try to focus on the fundamental paradigms that govern what can we say about machine learning, what can we do in machine learning, and some of the most important algorithmic ideas, not necessarily everything that was done this year or what was written about in the New York Times or other uh, places, but what I think are the most important algorithmic ideas. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about modeling, how to take a problem and make it a machine learning problem, because, uh, and what kind of issues come up when you do this, because this is what a lot of you uh, are going to do when you, um, when you go out and, and play mach with machine learning. And of course, a little bit about what we don't do, what we don't know. Okay, so, so what's, what's this class about? So uh, this is basically the table of content. As I said at the beginning, the website is not completely up to date. It's going to be a little bit better uh, up to date in terms of tentative schedule, but this slide is up to date. So we're going to, I'm introducing today some basic problems and questions. We're going to continue with this next time and talk about some of the key questions. We're going to address the puzzle uh, that uh, some of you are looking at now. It's going to be on the web uh, later tonight or tomorrow, so you can... Uh, look at it there. We're going to go through a detailed example already next time, I hope, for two reasons. One, to kind of, for the curious among you, to show you what kind of things uh, we're going to do, what are some of the basic technical things that, uh, we're going to play with, and also to give all of you, as soon as possible, some ideas that I'm not going to sit here or stand here all the time waving my hands. We're going to do a little bit of math and algorithms. Uh, hopefully most of you like it. Uh, if some of you don't like it, it will give you a good way immediately to say, well, I don't want to do this. Um, once we move to the real meat of the class, we're going to talk throughout the class about two basic learning paradigms, one which is called discriminative learning, another one that is more probabilistic, generative sometimes it's called. We're going to talk about multiple learning protocols. Supervised learning protocol is going to be the dominant learning protocol because really that's the only thing we know how to do. All the other learning protocols serve as a way to massage the problem into the supervised learning protocol. Unsupervised, semi-supervised, we're going to try to convince you that this is what's happening and teach you these paradigms these protocols, and we're going to touch on a lot of algorithms, gradient descent algorithms. In fact, it's plural because there are multiple ways of doing it. Decision trees, we're going to talk about linear representation, which are key in machine learning, multiple algorithms for linear representations. We're going to talk about neural networks and deep learning, uh, probabilistic representations. We're going to talk uh, only about simple algorithms here depending on time, talk about unsupervised or semi-supervised machine learning, an algorithm or a family of algorithms that is called EM, expectation maximizations, talk a little bit about clustering and dimensionality reductions, and in the course of doing all this, we're going to talk also about modeling, evaluation, uh, and some of the real-world challenges that come up when you do machine learning. I'm hoping to devote a little bit of time at the end to the ethics of machine learning. It's an interesting issue that comes up uh, more and more. Some of it you probably have seen in the news. 
let's see if we can uh, at least bring this up to your attention. Um, okay, so um, you probably noticed already, and I'm going to say it many more times, that I really like to talk to you guys. Uh, I want you to talk to me also. So please don't hesitate to ask questions, make comments, <coughs> say anything you want. Uh, and one secret is that if you have a question about something, about half the students around you have the same question or some version of this question. So you're doing them a favor asking them, asking the question. Yes. Yes. SVM, wait and see. Uh, <laughs> SVM stands for Support Vector Machines. It's an algorithm for linear representation. And EM stands for, stands for Expectation Maximization, another algorithm uh, for dealing with missing data. Uh, you will see all of it uh, in time. So, so basically, ask questions, make comments. Uh, I've written something about it on the web page already. The reason you want to ask me questions is twofold. One, to get the answer. Uh, two, maybe more than twofold. Two, to allow you, uh, give some breathing room to your other friends here and ask the questions for them. And three, and perhaps most important, it's a way to communicate to me uh, what's not clear, what's clear, to try to bridge terminology uh, between us. I'm going to throw at you a lot of stuff that is new to most of you, starting for SVM. That's the easy thing because it's just an acronym for something, but a lot of more abstract concepts. So it's important for me to know how you understand it, how you don't understand it, what are the mismatch that we have in our terminology, uh, and every question that you're going to ask is going to help all of us. So please do. Okay, you've already seen these slides. I talked about the registration. Uh, so, um, okay. What do I think you know? I'm hoping, given the prerequisites, uh, that all of you have had some exposure to theory of computation, 120, 121, or one of these classes, uh, probability theory, a little bit, at least discrete probability, uh, linear algebra, at least at the level of notations. You will not be completely scared to see a vector notation. Uh, now, for all of these, we are going to put some material uh, that you can look at, you will look at, uh, to kind of remember what's uh, there. We are also going to ask the TAs to give uh, quick refreshers on these topics, as well as on Python. But I'm hoping that this is going to be only a refresher because you've seen everything. If you haven't, I think you're going to have some trouble. If you have never programmed before, you first have to take some other classes. Uh, if you've programmed in other languages and you're good at it, I don't think that's going to be a big problem for you. To, to do Python, uh, but if you haven't seen anything uh, of this, it's going to be difficult. I'm still entertaining of whether giving you a short homework uh, that will be available next week, homework zero, just to give you an idea of what kind of things I think you know, uh, we'll see. As I said, participate and ask questions. It's really, it's really important uh, for all of us. Okay, some, po yes. Okay, I'll get to it. Um, I'll, I'll talk about, I think, I, oh, let me answer now, actually. So, so there are going to be five problem sets uh, plus quizzes, very, very short five, ten minutes quizzes that are uh, going to be taken online the day before uh, the first class of the week. Uh, the, the differences are going to be either not completely decided, either in the problem sets. It could be that 519 is going to get one additional problem, each problem set. It could be that the difference is going to be in the projects, that the 519 will be required uh, to have a project. We haven't finalized uh, the decision here. There will be a difference. 
if people have a specific uh, uh, interest here, or uh, I'm happy to, to listen to views. As I said, I have office hours twice a week, Tuesday, Thursday, 4.30 to 5.30. You're welcome to, to let me know what you think. You're also welcome to uh, say what you think on Piazza. Um, okay, some policies. Uh, cheating, that's, that's an important one. So there is a simple policy. Uh, and, and I'm hoping that you respect this because my assumption is that you come to this class because you want to be here. No one forced you to come to this class. I'm not promising that it's going to be a very easy class. I think that the problem sets are going to be time consuming. Uh, but you want to know this stuff. So spend the time, work hard. Uh, we are going to take these things seriously. So please, you know, it's, it's really an issue of respect to us, the team, and to your uh, other friends. Uh, homework. Uh, so we encourage you to collaborate on homework. Uh, basically, talk to your friends, form teams, uh, talk about everything, but it's essential that you write your own solution and code yourself. Uh, again, this is where most learning is being done. Even if you talked about it with people and you think that you know everything, once you sit down and start doing it and writing it, this is where you understand whether you understood it or not. So please do this yourself. Uh, we're also going to ask you to uh, declare who you uh, worked with and whether you used any sources and so on. But again, uh, I'm treating you as adults. You know, you came here because you want to take this class spend the time and, and make the effort. Um, late policy. So uh, again, it's very simple. There are only five problem sets. We're going to give you credit of four days, 96 hours. You can not use it. You can use all of it in the first problem set. That would be a mistake. Uh, you can do whatever you want. We're going to uh, keep track of it. You will also keep track of it because we're going to ask you to write down where you think you are every time and do whatever you want. You know. uh, I suggest to keep it to the end because maybe you'll need it. Uh, we're going to give you enough time uh, between problem sets. There are only five a semester. So you're going to have on average about three weeks uh, or close to it. So there shouldn't be a lot of time if you, if you do some planning. So that's it, 96 hours, uh, and after that, uh, we're not going to grade uh, the problem sets. Um, okay. Uh, grading might be different for 519, 419. We'll see exactly how this works and what the distribution uh, converges to. Um, I've had different experiences with, with mixed classes. Sometimes, you know, the top students in the class were the undergrads, and sometimes, on, on average, the undergrads were a little bit uh, weaker than the graduate students. It's not clear to me what's going to happen. We'll, we'll, we'll do as it, uh, we'll decide as we go. So this is uh, the tentative uh, split. 40% for homework, which means 8% for each problem set. Final 20%, medium 50%, quizzes 5%. This Hopefully, you figured out that this sums up to 80. Projects are going to be 20% if we decide that everyone does a project. Otherwise, we're going to scale this up and only 519 will do projects. We'll, do, we'll, we'll decide. Questions? Yeah. Uh, two quick questions. One about the late policy. Is that in terms, is the, the credit in terms of hours? Yes. So you did 25 and you get... It's 25. We count to 96. Yeah. Okay. And then for uh, the differences between 419 and 15, uh, 519, is there an easy way to switch between, or do you just need to do uh, Do it soon. Okay. So uh, if you want to switch, do it in the first two weeks of the semester. Um, other questions? 
Yes. Say it again. I didn't get it. Tips for success. Um, I think listen carefully, read the lecture notes, ask questions if you can, and, and do the, the problem sets. I mean, I think it's, uh, everyone starts with A+. Plus. I think you can maintain it. You just have to uh, try and, and, and do the work. I think it's, uh, I'm hoping it's going to be an interesting class, so we'll keep you uh, on your toes. Just, just do, the, do the work. I think it's uh, not, no, no secrets here. And, and uh, come to the office hours. Uh, there are going to be a lot of office hours. We have 90 A's. I have office hours. Uh, we are, in addition to office hours, twice a week we are going to give um, sessions uh, that, the, that the TAs will give. At the beginning it's going to be topical, you know, we're going to give you some Python tutorials, some math tutorials uh, to make sure that you are on top of things. And later on we're going to devote them to discussing the problem sets or introducing other problems that are similar just to give you uh, a better feeling for what's happening. Please use it. Use the time. Uh, there's a team of 10 people that are spending a lot of time. Uh, make use of these resources. Yes? Do you think the tutorials and everything will be recorded? Um, actually, I'm not sure. That's a good question because the tutorials are planned to be not here but rather in 3401. Uh, I don't know if it's possible to do that. Uh, I'll check. Yes? No. So, uh, so that's one of the issues I have with project. You know, project is a great idea. I think people, if the project is planned well, people can gain a lot from project, but pro the, the idea of projects doesn't scale so well to classes of 150 students because someone needs to talk to you about the projects and guide you about the projects and read your project reports. It's almost impossible to do this in a fair way. So my goal is going to be to give you more interesting problem sets that are like projects and minimize the individual project just because I don't think that it scale well. Uh, and once it doesn't scale well, it's a little bit unfair to the people that are doing it. So that's my perception. Uh, I'm willing to listen to any system people or any ideas people have to, to do this the right way. Other questions? Okay, so one other thing I wanted to say is um, class webpage uh, is going to be one of the key sources for you. The notes are going to be there pointers to videos, pointer to resources, uh, and the schedule. As I said, there's going to be a tentative schedule, uh, and we're going to update it uh, as we go. You can already go to, uh, to the website, go to Piazza. Um, I'm also happy to take volunteers to scribe the class, to basically generate good documents that give the content uh, you can use the video if you want. If people are interested and they, are good, they think that they are good writers, uh, please uh, drop me an email, let me know. Final questions. Okay, so, so I'm going to keep this short. I'm just going to uh, ask you a few questions. So... Oh, in, in fact, before that, any other administrative? Yes? How soon can we expect the wait list to start? It's already moving. Yeah. So, so I, I look at it every few days. Uh, as of today, there are four spots in the class, and we're going to fill it today, tomorrow. As I said, if you know that you're planning to drop, do it now so that people can come in. That's, that's what we do. So it's, it's a moving target. Uh, yeah? Is the course going to have a Canvas page? 
Yes. Yes, so, so Canvas is going to be used for submissions and, and uh, for the quizzes, whatever else we can use it for. Yeah. Uh, if we don't have a very good linear algebra background, um, do you think it's like feasible to pick up on our own if we're uh, I think you can pick up everything on your own, so it's really your decision. Uh, so, so the issue is this, at the beginning of the semester, uh, linear algebra is going to be used mostly for notations. So we're going to play with vectors, we're going to play with, you know, dot products, very simple linear algebra. If you've seen it before, you should be okay. Uh, toward the end of the semester, there are going to be a couple of lectures where we're going to use linear algebra a little bit heavier. We're going to do projection, eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and so on. By that time, you want to have seen it. So um, if you haven't seen linear algebra at all and you're going to be scared from vector and transpose and, you know, stuff like that, prepare. Uh, I assume most of the people here are not in that situation. Yeah. Uh, not exactly, not exactly. Uh, but because we give preference to CIS students and we give preference to people that must take it and it's their last semester. Now, we cannot accommodate all these people, unfortunately, but that's the preference. And after that, yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the... the Waiting list is managed by uh, the academic office here. Uh, I think it's possible to ask them. I'll, I'll try to figure it out, yeah. Yes? Uh, can people on waitlist have access to Canvas and Um I think no. Uh, you can access, you can, so the lecture notes are going to be open. Videos are going to be open. Canvas, I don't think, is going to be open. Okay, so uh, if uh, we're going to give the first problem set before the last day of uh, registering to the class, then we're going to do something with the people on the waiting list to allow them not to lose. So we're talking here uh, either on a non-event or on the first problem set, depending on the timing. So, so that's a good point. We'll, we'll address this. Yeah. I don't want you to lose because you registered a little bit late. Yeah. Is the homework supposed to be submitted in latex? Is that what you're saying here? Uh, what I'm saying, what I'm talking about here is, is describing, uh, but, but the answer is yes. Yes, yeah, so, so we will not take handwritten solutions, only type solution. I highly recommend that you do it in LaTeX because there's going to be some math stuff and it's much easier. We're going to give you uh, templates for the LaTeX and some pointers if you've never done this before. Uh, for most of you, it's actually a good skill to have and something that is very, very easy to, to master. Yeah. Yes, so the, the problem sets will not be all programming. They'll also be, you'll have to generate a report, you'll have to answer some questions, you'll have to, yeah, do some work beyond the programming. <coughs> yeah. What's your office? Oh, uh, again, on the website you'll find it. It's in 3401, uh, 461C. Fourth floor, C wing, Walk down the hall and you'll see it. Uh, so, by the way, the 3401, for some reason that I fail to understand, is locked, even for people with pen IDs. But during office hours, it's going to be open. Uh, so if you don't have the privilege of getting into it by the virtue of your pen ID, uh, you will be able to get in uh, during office hours. So, 
Uh, and if you, if there is a problem, it's supposed to work already. If there is a problem, drop me an email. Uh, I'll monitor it and make sure that I come to open the doors. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to uh, do it today, but I do want to ask a question. Without giving the answer, anyone thinks that they solved the machine learning puzzle I gave you? Okay, several of you think that they solved the puzzle. So I don't want the answer. We're going to get the answer next time. I'm going to give all of you a chance to look at it and also to look at it at the way. But what I do want to know is why do you think that you... Are you sure that you solved it? Who is sure that you have the right answer? Come on. Yes, you're sure. So why are you sure? And this is an important question. It's not... It's, not, uh, it's, it's really a machine learning question. Yes, why, why do you think it's, it's the right answer? Okay, because you measure that your answer is consistent with the data and you think it's consistent. Excellent. Uh, someone there, yeah. yeah. Just one second. So, so I think people will not hear you because there's a lot of buzz and excitement, which is good, but yes. Excellent. Not only coincidental, uh, can you give me this? I can give you another solution that is consistent with the data. This page, right? It's consistent with the data. But you won't take this as a satisfactory solution, right? So consistency is a good criterion, but not a convincing criterion. So very good point. So, uh, so someone else that is convinced that they got the solution, give me a reason for why you are sure. Yes. N nothing that has to reveal the solution in, in your answer, yes. No, but I, I assume since um, it um, touches on one of the difficulties in our classification problems, uh, that, like, such as prior knowledge, uh, I thought it would be appropriate that logically it would be um, the rule that I think uh, is dependent on, um, is relevant to the solution. Okay, okay, so that's an interesting, so you're saying, you know, I have some, model, yes. and when I look at the model, it seems to me kind of an interesting model for these kind of people. Yes. Okay. Uh, that, that's a legitimate answer. I don't think it's convincing enough from a machine learning perspective. You, you're getting into perhaps important social issues. Yes? Right, right. But this still doesn't answer. I want a convincing answer that says, I think this is a very likely correct solution because Okay, we're going to stop here. Remember, uh, I'm not going to take any more, but remember that one way I said consistency, which is an important uh, criterion, I wasn't happy with it because I showed you another consistent solution, right? So I want more than just consistency. It will be a hand-wavy argument that it will be a good one. So we're going to start with this on Tuesday and talk about a few other issues. Uh, question about this? Okay, so see you again uh, Tuesday. Uh, in principle, yes, I want to wait to make this official at least a week or two to see, I think I'm not allowed to have 50 people on the stairs. So once it sparsifies a little bit, it should be okay. Yeah.
in that time, like, can I just sit here and then... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Hi. I'd ask to be Adam with SEO October. I've seen you never ask to be Adam with SEO October. And you know that you are on the waiting list? I don't know if I am. So I've never uh, oh, okay. So, um, I think you should be, but drop me another email and I'll make sure that you are on the mailing list. Essentially, what I'm going to do is I'm going to forward your name again to the waiting list to be on the safe side. But just remind me that you send me email before. Okay. Would I, uh, is the waiting list like first come first serve? No. As I said, there are, the department has these policies. There are some students that have to take the class now because they're graduating and it's part of the program. So these are first priority. Oh. Is it the, the vowels on the second? Don't 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 talk about answers. Okay. Now. <laughs>